Few stars can match the mysterious glamour of Garbo, the smolder of Valentino, or the daring charm of Louise Brooks. But silent film stars faced all manner of hurdles, including persistent racism, homophobia, rabid tabloids, and much more. The idea of celebrities had already been established by theater actors in the centuries leading up to the first films of the late 19th century. Yet filmmakers weren't initially keen on making actor-centric narratives, sometimes preferring to wow audiences with special effects or simply showing something as it happened, documentary style. Humans were almost an afterthought, though some forward-thinking producers called upon already well-known performers like dancers and vaudevillians to grace the screen. Things began to change around 1907 when the growth of the film industry meant that film actors got more regular work. Still, it was hardly prestigious, and studios were inconsistent when it came to promoting their emerging stars. Moving pictures were not considered legitimate theater, and some stage actors who might make a film for money didn't want their name associated with it. America's first movie star is considered to be Florence Lawrence, who began her career in vaudeville, then went on to become known as the Biograph Girl. The Lawrence would be known by name and would be the subject of a major studio PR campaign. Most studios of the time preferred to keep their stars anonymous for fear of having to pay them a higher wage. At one point or another, Florence Lawrence may have wished to be anonymous. Sure, she went from being the mysterious Biograph Girl to a genuine celebrity, but fame came with the dark side. Lawrence once attended a premiere where fans tore the buttons from her coat. Producer Carl Lemley even went so far as to claim she died in a streetcar accident just to increase sales for one of her films. Tabloid-style gossip began as early as 1913, focusing on stars' glamorous lifestyles. Studio representatives presented stars' private lives as squeaky-clean examples of morality, thereby elevating the previously unsavory reputation of the young film industry. Early fan magazines tended to burnish the rough edges of scandals, too. Photoplay magazine reported on the 1920 marriage of Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, who ditched their previous spouses to get married. It did so in such a gentle way that it seemed hardly worth commenting on. But just eight years later, Photoplay published a far more graphic and invasive expose of Clara Bow's difficult life. So much so that fellow actors were alarmed at the precedent. They had a right to be. As time went on, celebrity reporting only got worse. Child stars aren't new. Perhaps the most famous child star of the silent era is Jackie Coogan. In 1916, at just 18 months old, Coogan appeared in Skinner's Baby, though his big break was a 1921 classic The Kid alongside Charlie Chaplin. He earned fantastic amounts of money, but later learned that his parents had spent it all. His experience led to the passage of the Child Actors Bill in California, more commonly known as the Coogan Law, which still regulates the contracts of child actors and how their income is managed today. Coogan was far from the only kid to face the unregulated and often uncaring Hollywood machine. Diana Sarah Carey, once known as Baby Peggy, told The Guardian she wasn't formally educated and often faced dangerous situations on set. Her earnings were also wasted away by careless parents who seemed more interested in putting her to work than making sure she was educated, safe, or loved. Carrie, who died in 2020 at age 101, went on to write at length about her experiences. Cocaine was temporarily falling out of favor in the U.S. by the 1920s, but it remained prevalent in Hollywood. Rumors swirled about the habits of actors, from overly peppy comedians to exhausted stars who needed a pick-me-up to keep going. Actress Barbara Lamar died at only 29 years old, after a career spent indulging all manner of substances. Her son Don Gallery told the Los Angeles Times that she regularly used heroin, and even went so far as to leave a container of cocaine out in the open on her piano. Actor Wallace Reed infamously lost both his career and his life in the wake of a morphine addiction. After a bloody train accident on a film set, a studio-supplied doctor gave Reed morphine to keep him working through his injuries. After he'd seemingly healed, Reed couldn't quit the opiates. He died on January 18, 1923, of what another doctor said was kidney failure and pneumonia made all the worse by morphine withdrawal. Stunt performers appeared as soon as 1903's The Great Train Robbery, yet stars like Buster Keaton insisted on performing some of their own stunts, no matter how dangerous. Keaton did all kinds of death-defying stunts, relying on his physical comedy experience from the vaudeville circuit to stay alive. He cited his immense body control as one of the reasons he'd survived. The most famous and terrifying of his stunts comes from 1928's Steamboat Bill Jr. There, Keaton stood completely still as the facade of a massive house fell on top of him, hoping he would still be standing when it hit the ground around him. Keaton came through the stunt hole, but he wasn't always so lucky. He'd been knocked unconscious on set, suffered broken bones, and even fractured his neck during one stunt. Harold Lloyd, another silent film comedian great, suffered a 1919 accident where half of his right hand was obliterated in an on-set explosion with a prop bomb which made his later stunts all the more impressive. The bomb went off, went right straight up and blew a big hole about that big in the ceiling. 
Other actors suffered frostbite, bone-shattering wagon crashes, and even fatal drownings after being thrown from a horse. One of the earliest movie blockbusters, 1915's The Birth of a Nation, hinged on deeply racist depictions of black Americans. Reactions to the film included riots, bans, and the rise of the modern Ku Klux Klan. Inside the film industry, it wasn't much better. As the British Film Institute reports, black filmmakers like Oscar Micheaux and performer Paul Robeson continued to operate as independent creators outside of the growing Hollywood system. They worked in what were known as race films that catered to black audiences. Filmmakers had a complicated relationship with this setup, which allowed them to create movies with all black casts and sometimes crews, but in a segregated system with low budgets and little to no access to Hollywood resources. Some worried they were playing into stereotypes in order to sell tickets and distribute films. But many artists were compelled to take part in the developing form, creating and distributing stories that spoke to an audience being neglected by Hollywood. Many of these films were direct responses to the overt racism of Birth of a Nation, including one titled The Birth of a Race. By reclaiming that space in the culture, you could show positive images of black people outside of the white context. Few of these race films have survived, meaning that researchers rely on things like posters and advertisements to prove that these works ever existed. Yet the independent black film industry continued operating well after the introduction of talkies into the 1950s. Sasu Hayakawa was a skilled naturalistic actor whose work was a stark contrast to the stiff performances of other silent era film stars. With his athletic build and smoldering good looks, he was a hunk. But opposite white co-stars, Hayakawa was often cast as the villain or rejected lover. Despite this, Hayakawa had a long career that saw him establish a production company, work in Europe, and star opposite Alec Guinness in 1957's The Bridge on the River Kwai. Anna Mae Wong was also a bona fide movie star, though she too seemed to be perpetually sidelined. She broke through as the tragic lead in 1922's The Toll of the Sea. Wong's character, Lotus Flower, is an abandoned single mother previously married to a white man, the father of her child. Going forward, in order to work, Wong gritted her teeth and took roles as pliable damsels, vampy villainesses, and other stereotypes. Pathetic dying seemed to be the best thing I did. Like Hayakawa, Wong continued to work well into the talkie era, though she rarely got a leading role and even reportedly lost the lead role of Olan in 1937's The Good Earth, even though the film is set in China. The role in the Best Actress Oscar instead went to German-American actress Louise Rayner in Yellowface. Queer people in Hollywood faced a difficult choice, live openly and lose their career, or stay closeted and keep acting. Some were able to balance both for a time, like actor William Haynes, who lived openly with his partner until his career wound down and he became a successful interior designer. Others kept their personal lives on intense lockdown. Fame's drag performer Julian Elting made some silent films based on his popular stage acts, but was secretive about his private life. He engaged in performative straight behavior like smoking, drinking, and getting engaged, but never married to multiple women. Oh, I've seen pictures of you, Mr. Elkins, and you were dressed just like a lady. Yes, but don't forget, I always have a cigar in my mouth. <laughs> Women were hardly exempt from the homophobia of silent era Hollywood. According to Diane McClellan's The Girls, Sappho Goes to Hollywood, Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich carried on an affair that both would deny to their dying days. Did you, did you know her? No. First no, I did not. You did meet her? No. Never? No. Others saw that their sexuality remained a stumbling block, no matter how secretive they were. According to the New York Times, in 1919, actress Jean Aker found herself in a lavender marriage to Rudolph Valentino, meant to obscure her sexuality. The pair soon divorced, but after his second marriage ended in a similar fashion, speculation soon turned to Valentino himself. With so much sexual debauchery running rampant in Hollywood, some actresses hoping to break into the movies were presented with an unseemly proposition. As a 1920 article in Photoplay described it, rumors swirled that aspiring stars had to disappear into a back room with some powerful executive or producer to get a key contract. The article ultimately deemed the accusations to be largely unfounded. Yet, with the modern casting couch rumors still a part of the entertainment industry, it's hard to dismiss the older stories of silent film stars like Louise Brooks, who claimed to see one woman get a contract at MGM after meeting with a higher up. I do want the job, so this. I, I can't. There was even a stag film titled The Casting Couch, released in 1924, which showed just such a scenario. However, it wouldn't be fair to pretend that all women in Hollywood were helpless waifs, thrown at the feet of drooling predators. 
You know, the nice thing about buying food for a man is that you don't have to laugh at his jokes. The silent film era actually held room for many female creators, including not just actresses, but writers, directors, and producers. It was only during the transitions to talkies with increased budgets requiring major financing that women were forced out of positions of power in Hollywood. There's a popular idea that many silent film actors didn't transition to the talkies because their voices were unfit to record. Pierre, you shouldn't have come. Pierre, you shouldn't have come. The classic 1952 musical comedy Singing in the Rain hinges on this, as fictional actress Lena Lamont struggles to drop her thick, squeaky Brooklyn accent. But was this really the case? Movie Silently points out that many actors made the transition to sound just fine, though some experienced a few speed bumps along the way, like actress Marion Davies, who suffered from a stutter. While the epicaricacy-infused image of silent film greats stumbling over something as simple as talking may have been overstated, a few stars really did hit a wall when presented with a microphone. For example, actor Carl Dane's career did begin a downturn as talkies rose, though his thick Danish accent was only part of the problem. Perhaps the poor reputation of silent film stars' voices also had something to do with the movie studios. As former child star Diana Sarah Carey, aka Baby Peggy, told The Guardian, film executives talk trash about silent films to make it seem as if the more expensive and complicated sound movies were worth all the effort. Some silent stars, herself included, saw their light fade as a result. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.